This happened to me when I was 14. I'm 34 now. This is a story about a relative of mine. Let's just call her Mrs. A. When I was a child, Mrs. A's husband unfortunately passed away. She used to be very talkative, friendly, and outgoing. However, after the loss of her husband, her personality changed quite quickly. She became very quiet and distant, and eventually we drifted apart. One night, towards the end of basketball practice, I think it was around 8.30 or so, I was surprised to see Mrs. A there, standing at the gym doors. Although I hadn't seen her for a few years now, I instantly recognized her at a first glance. I told one of the teachers she was a relative of mine. The teacher acknowledged this and walked over to talk to her. They began a conversation, and the teacher walked back to me with a very serious look on his face. I was speechless. She's come to take you to the hospital. I think something happened to your father, so you should go with her. I was mortified, needless to say. I jumped into her car and we pulled away from the school, speeding down the dark streets. I began to ask Mrs. A many questions. Where's my dad's hospital? What happened? Is he alright? I was quite shocked though when she responded with simple cold-blooded answers, not really trying to comfort me at all. She was solely focused on driving and I felt no warmth from her at all. We were headed into the suburbs. The further we drove away, the more suspicious it started to become. We were driving out into a rural area and we were reaching the mountains. I knew that all the main hospitals were in the city. Once you started heading towards these mountainous ranges, there weren't any hospitals at all. At least not until the next city over, which is very far away. Every time I started talking to her and asking her more questions, she would reply with a single cold, blunt answer. I started to wonder if the woman driving this car was really my relative at all. No longer driving on city roads, shops and houses were getting scarcer and scarcer. I knew that before long, we would be really far out into the countryside. I saw the light of a home center up ahead. It was still open. I quickly told her that I'd forgotten something, and I really had to step out and call my teacher quickly. I asked her if she could do me a favor and pull over for a second. I really needed to speak to him right now. It absolutely could not wait. Somehow, after a bit of conversing, I managed to persuade her to pull over at the home center. I walked out in a hurry, trying to appear as calm as possible, and entered the center. I waited in a spot I couldn't easily be seen on the inside, and I peeked out through the store's window. I saw Mrs. A's car in the parking lot. She wasn't in the driver's side though, she was already walking towards the store. I can't explain it, but I just had this terrible feeling as I saw her approaching. I ran to the other side and sprinted through the exit doors, watching the streets carefully. Luckily, a taxi was approaching. I ran in front of their car to get them to stop swiftly, and I told them my address. While I was on the way back home, the whole time I was worried about my father. When I finally arrived home, my mom paid the taxi fare. I walked into my house and saw my father right there, sat down in the living room drinking a beer and watching TV. What's wrong? What's with that look on your face? He said. I explained to him what just happened, and his face turned pale. He looked terribly concerned. Apparently, when Mrs. A's husband had passed away, eventually she suffered a nervous breakdown and complete psychotic break. She was admitted into the hospital, and she lost contact with the family. Many family members grew quite worried about her behavior. My father said that because she didn't have her own children, she was always alone. Perhaps that affected her mental state. My father called her home phone number. In those days, mobile phones weren't too common. Then, my father called Mrs. A's family. Her mother answered and told us Mrs. A had been absent from her part-time job today. 
they were just about to call around and ask where she was. The next day, the police searched her home. In their report, they noted that her purse and various other items were still left there. They were at a loss as to the location of Mrs. A and her car, and what was going on here. They did find lots of empty cans, bottles of alcohol, and prescription drugs. It's now been about 20 years, and we haven't heard or seen Mrs. A at all. No one knows her whereabouts either. Perhaps I was the last person to see her, through that window, walking towards the home center. Due to the long period of time that's passed, nothing can really be discovered further about this situation, nor the reasons behind her attempted abduction of me. I can't imagine what could have happened to me on that day if I didn't get out of that car right there and then. Where was she planning on taking me? Why was she planning on taking me? I wonder sometimes if she's still out there, perhaps watching me. I have so many unanswered questions. This story took place three years ago, when I was in sixth grade. I always loved watching my school plays, ever since I was in fourth grade. I attended drama club and or theater at the time. We were preparing for a play which was The Wonderful World of Oz. I played a small part in this, which was as a jitterbug. We were all waiting in the singing room for our instructions on what we were going to be practicing that day. In the room, I would always hang out with either the other kids in my grade or the older kids. There had always been a tree in front of our school, which was planted in remembrance of the previous drama director. It became sort of an urban legend at my school. Some said his body was buried right under the tree. Of course, that's just stuff kids say, and no one knew for sure if this was true. I'll be honest, I really didn't believe it. Some even said he haunted the theater. They said that when a play was occurring, sometimes he could be seen in the top row of seats sitting down and watching. I never believed that either. Despite me loving scary rumors, I didn't believe in the supernatural at all. It just sounded stupid, you know? One night, when we had gone to practice for the play a bit, not a lot of people were there at the time for whatever strange reason. Since I didn't really have anyone to talk to, I started reading a book instead. I had brought it with me in case I got too bored, and I was grateful to have it in this instance. And that's when one of the other kids who was in my grade tapped on my shoulder and said that he wanted to show me something. I asked him what he wanted me to check out, and he said he thought he may have seen someone in the band room, which was, by the way, directly next to the singing room. You could look into the room to the window of the door which connected the two rooms together. He looked to be seriously frightened. He said he'd seen someone in that room for sure, but the teacher was gone, and he didn't know who it could be in that instance, not to mention the freakiest part of all. The doors to the room were locked. The band teacher always locked it up after they left that area. It was a bit unnerving, but I wasn't scared just yet. Since he kept asking me, though, I decided to check it out for him and ease his fears a bit. I peered through the door's window, thinking it was just a prank or he was scared of shadows or something. People at this school always love to play tricks on each other. I thought maybe this was one of them. I went down to the small short hallway where the door was. I looked through the window. At first, I didn't see anything. Then though, as I turned my head and started checking out the rest of the room, that's when I saw someone there. There looked to be a very tall man standing next to the door that led to the instrument room. What was even weirder was that the door was wide open. Again, all those doors were usually locked at night. The only details I could make out about that person, since it was very dark and no lights were on in that area, was that the man was tall and appeared to be wearing a fedora or some type of hat. I was scared, wondering how this man had gotten in. 
I wanted to call the police or something, but at the time, I didn't have a phone to do so. The guy who'd asked me to check it out was standing back at the end of the hallway. He asked me if I'd seen anything. I turned towards him to answer, and stupidly, I told him no. He was already scared enough, and I didn't want him to freak out and alert the man or something. He sighed with relief and said thanks. I told him it was no problem. I was about to sit down in the room and take a moment to think. Maybe it was just my eyes playing tricks on me. Maybe it was a weird shadow cast by a prop or something. I decided to look one more time just to be sure, though. I looked around and didn't see the man at all anymore. As I looked towards the TV area, though, I thought I could see him hiding behind it. I nearly screamed. It felt like I'd become paralyzed. I couldn't move or even think. The only question in my mind was how was this guy doing this and how was he here? The creepiest part was his smile, though. It wasn't necessarily an intentionally creepy smile or something, but it was still one that brought shivers to my spine. It was like a welcoming and friendly one, but that's when I heard him say something, the words that still creep me out to this day. Come over here, child. Let's practice together. I was freaking terrified. I had no idea what to do. Maybe I was just having a nightmare, like I used to do when I was a child. I was so scared I closed my eyes and counted to ten. I opened them, and as soon as I did, I screamed at the top of my lungs. He was right in front of me. Through the window, I could see him wearing a clown-like attire and makeup on his face. He was pressing it against the window, doing that godforsaken smile. I thought he was about to try and break the glass and do something terrible to me. Before anything else happened, though, one of the high schoolers came to check up on me. He tapped my shoulder and asked if I was okay. I screamed as soon as he touched me, thinking somehow the man had gotten around behind me. Instinctively, I turned around as fast as I could back to the door window. I was relieved a bit because now nothing was there. The high schooler asked me what happened and why I screamed. I didn't lie this time. I told him the full truth. He decided to go look for himself. I told him he shouldn't do so, but he ignored me. I waited to hear him scream or gasp in surprise or something as he realized I was telling the truth, but he never did so. Apparently, the man was no longer there. We went back to the group to continue practicing, and for the rest of the night, nothing weird happened. No matter how hard I tried, I kept thinking and even dreaming about that scary clown. I told my mom about it, but she told me I must have just been seeing things that night. I don't know. It's way too real for that. Either way, I did my best to try and forget it. This happened a couple of weeks ago. A little background first, though. I'm 16 years old, and I look older than I actually am. I walk to school every day. On this particular day, it was very dark outside. I had started my walk at about 6 o'clock in the morning. This was around the time that killer clouds were all over the news. I remember brushing it off and thinking that if any of those guys messed with me, I would take them on and kick their ass. I was walking to school and getting ready to go under the underpass. Over me, a train was crossing. I've always had a fear this thing would collapse once I was underneath it, so I always waited for the train to go by before I continued. As I was waiting for the train to finish going over, I heard a tree branch snap somewhere behind me. I looked behind me and around me. On either side of the road was dark woods. I looked around, scanning the trees, when I noticed a bright red color. Around these parts, it was common to see some homeless people in their little camps for the night. I thought this might be someone's tent or something, so I turned back towards the underpass and started to ignore it. I waited for the train to exit. I didn't realize how long the train was going to be, though, so I ended up waiting far longer than I usually did. 
I was staring at my phone, reading some texts and playing some games. And that's when I heard those footsteps behind me again. I turned around. My heart pounded so hard I thought I was going to die. I saw someone in a clown costume with a baseball bat in his hand. Of course, I started freaking out. I was praying the train would end already, but it didn't. It was just so long. I didn't have time to wait for it any longer. I closed my eyes and ran underneath. I kept running and running until I got to town. I stopped at a restaurant. Inside, there was only one other person. It happened to be the only employee there at the time. I quickly told them everything that happened. I admit I was pretty scared, so it was all coming out in a jumbled mess. They just laughed at me. I was too scared to finish walking to school by myself, so I called my mom to come pick me up. I tried to tell her what happened, but she didn't believe me either. After that day, I stopped walking to school. I don't know if it was a prank or what. All I know is that I thought my life was in danger from this creepy clown. The most sickening feeling I ever got came from knowing the man must have been watching my house, waiting to see when I would come out and go for my daily jog, just before dusk. I wondered how many days he must have been watching to know the house would be empty, and that that time window he used to break into my home would be optimal, just a 20-minute sliver of time. Once I arrived home that day, it took me a few minutes to even figure out what had happened. When I got home, my heart was already pounding and my body was covered in cool sweat. My mind was racing before I even saw the broken window in my laundry room. It was tucked in the far corner of the house, a floor level window, the perfect entry point. I wondered if whoever this intruder was had already cased my house a couple of times. Maybe when I was still home or even asleep in the middle of the night even. I couldn't think of a reason why they thought my house was a particularly attractive target. I have almost nothing of value, and I'm a very modest person. What happened was a burglar had broken into my home, stolen some of my fake jewelry, an old bottle of antibiotics, and a broken iPhone. All in all, the value of everything taken was probably just under $100 tops. What they had accomplished, though, was shattering my trust in the world more than anything else. As they say, the best things in life are free. After realizing what happened, I gave the rest of the house a quick look over as I talked to the 911 dispatcher and had him relay the cops towards my home. I waited out front for them to arrive. Law enforcement didn't exactly present me with any revelations I didn't already know. Someone broke in, stole some items, and ran out, all in the span of just a few minutes while I was out on my jog. They were going to keep eyes out and ears open for anything suspicious, but that's about all they could do. At the moment, at least a couple of them were nice enough to stick around and board up the broken window for me. They also recommended some cheaper but non-sketchy motels I could check into for a while if I didn't want to stay in the house for a couple of nights. Most kindly, one of the officers even offered to help me set up a video security system he had but didn't need anymore. He said it could be installed in 20 minutes. It was basically just a glorified baby monitor, but it was great to keep an eye on your place if you weren't there. Just place it next to the big floor-level window to scare off anyone sizing up the place. He ran home and brought it back and hooked it up in my house while some other officers helped me patch up the window. I thanked them for being so kind to me and turned down the motel idea. My boyfriend Jacob would be over in an hour or two anyway, and that was enough to make me comfortable enough to stay in the home that night. I knew it was probably just some desperate tweaker willing to bust in for $100 worth of stuff, and likely they would not come back again. The police confirmed that they thought so as well. 
I just asked if one of them could park out front until my boyfriend got home. They agreed and Jacob arrived around 9pm. The night moved on and I told him all the details. He didn't seem to be particularly concerned. He agreed with my initial assessment, although he did keep his hunting shotgun right next to my bed, just in case the person decided to come back. It wasn't easy, but I was eventually able to fall asleep. I got a few hours of the sweet embrace of slumber before the quick sound of a text message coming to my phone shook me awake. I groaned and walked to the bathroom to relieve myself. I forgot about the text by the time I got back to bed, and I didn't check it. I wish I had checked that message, though. I checked the message first thing in the morning. It was from my mom. I had avoided telling her what happened because I knew she would freak out and drive all the way from Sacramento in the middle of the night just to comfort me. All that would do was make me more freaked out. Apparently, Jacob had posted a photo of his shotgun resting next to the bed with a little bit of a story to it. My mom saw this on social media and started texting me at 1am. Her first text was actually very helpful and something Jacob and I should have thought about the night before. I saw Jacob's post about what happened. I'm sorry that happened to you. Did you make sure the police checked every inch of your house to make sure the guy isn't still there? My mom actually had a great point. I never asked the cops just how much they'd scoured the house. They just said he'd ran off sometime before I got home, and that was it. Jacob and I had not really done a thorough job of checking either. I woke up Jacob and told him we needed to search everywhere in the house. He was tired and unhappy, but agreed to do it with a shotgun in hand. What we found underneath my bathroom sink horrified me. There was a large cabinet directly underneath the sink in the bathroom of my bedroom, about the size of a washing machine. I had never really thought about it until now. I didn't use it normally either. I casually pulled the cabinet open, almost as an afterthought. It was immediately overtaken by the hideous scent of male B.O. I started coughing as I looked away, and my eyes connected with Jacob who had a look of alarm on his face I had never seen before. I followed Jacob's eyes and the stench to the space below the sink where I saw a filthy jean jacket and what looked like human excrement. There were also the bottles of pills which had been missing. We called the cops and had the house 100% searched. Nothing turned up, but the cop who gave me the video system pointed out we should review the footage to see if anything happened during the night. Jacob and I watched the footage on my laptop with a few cops hanging over our shoulders. I was almost frozen in fear, despite the sheer amount of armed men in the room whose job it was to protect me. We had set up the cameras in three different areas, so we had three different shots we could watch of what happened. One in my bathroom, one in my bedroom, and one in the living room which fed out into the front driveway of the house. As we watched the footage, it started with the camera set up in my bedroom. The angle the camera provided showed my bedroom through the open door. A timestamp said it was just after 3am when movement finally started to happen. Jacob and I were sleeping in our bed and we watched in horror as the dark figure of a man stretched himself out from underneath the bathroom sink in the other camera. He took a moment to steady himself in the bathroom before he slowly walked into our bedroom. He walked right up to my bed where Jacob and I were sleeping. He just stopped at the foot of our bed and stood there for a good 20 seconds, staring at us as we slept. He then walked out of the bedroom door. We watched the intruder simply walk out the front door at that point. He even somehow locked the front door on his way out. The whole thing had a strange feeling of politeness to it, but it was in no way friendly. It would have been much better had the intruder rifled through all my stuff or stolen all my things. Heck, it might have been better if he had attacked me hiding under the sink where I had brushed my teeth and washed my face just a few hours before than walking away and disappearing. That was the worst thing he could have possibly done. This felt so much more personal than opportunistic, like maybe this was all planned. I never stayed another night in that house. 
I moved a couple of towns over into a secure apartment building with heavy security. Still, though, I could never sleep easy at night, even if Jacob and his shotgun were by my side. I've done my best to fight through it. My new apartment had a little compartment beneath the sink as well, and when I moved in my first night in the new apartment, I had Jacob come over with tools from work and take that hinge off. I feel a certain comfort each night when I'm able to kick my feet into that open space while I brush my teeth. It does just a little bit to calm my nerves, but it will never be quite the same again. So, we're at this camper near Dover Lights in Arkansas. Not the fanciest campsite, but we managed to find this guy that spends a lot of time out there while also working. So, he just vacations in the woods half the year. The guy offered to let my friend watch the place while he went to visit his son. Of course, my friend automatically invited me and some other people to come hang out with him and we all spent a few days there drinking, smoking, fishing, and just messing around. All in all, it was pretty okay. That is, until my female friend got super drunk and barged outside in the middle of the night buck naked to eat beans by the handful out of a cold pot. As someone who admires cleanliness, I followed her out and tried to make sure she didn't hurt herself or something, while well, everyone else just sat there laughing at her. So there she is, covered in beans, and I'm trying to convince her to settle down and clean herself up with a towel or something. Suddenly, though, her head shoots up like a deer in the headlights. She just glares at the trees around us. We were alone, and it was pitch black. She glared before literally growling, then sprinting off into the woods. I had no idea what to do. I'd completely lost sight of her, and she was naked in the woods all by herself. After a few failed attempts to call out to her, I did the stupidest thing I could have done. I followed her all alone, about five meters into the complete darkness. I looked down, and I noticed a faint light. As I looked closer, I noticed it was someone's phone. I picked it up, and saw it was already in camera mode. There were pictures of all of us, very recently taken pictures, all in this creepy night vision mode, some looking like they were taken from the window of the camper even. The last one was of my friend, running directly towards the camera. Realizing what happened, I deleted those pictures and stomped the phone on a rock, crushing the screen with my foot. Still unable to find my friend, and freaking out, I doubled back to the camper, I knew I was going to need to ask for help, only I found her right there, still very drunk in a lawn chair, still naked as well. I grabbed her and carried her back inside. I let her boyfriend towel her off, and they both passed out, spooning on the bottom bunk. I never did tell them what really happened, and she didn't remember in the morning either. I did lock the door and wake up every hour though, just to keep an eye on things. Luckily, nothing else ever happened. My cousin is with the Forest Service in the Montana-Wyoming area. I decided to go up there with her to literally test the waters. She does hydrology and has to ride out to the middle of nowhere to test streams and snow runoff to ensure there are no contaminants. I thought that sounded kind of fun, and I wanted to do a bit of a tour and spend some time with her anyway. We were going to have to camp out there for two nights, so we packed up all our gear and saddlebags and started out. The first night and day was amazing. Beautiful scenery, amazing air quality, it really was so peaceful out there. We started out on the second day. My cousin asked, hey, you want to see something weird? Of course, I said yes. She led me up on a bit of a side journey into this tiny little ravine. We ended up traveling about two hours away from our actual path. We went down and at the very end of this fold in the land, she dismounted and told me to get off my horse as well. 
We tied them up in this little clearing, and she told me to follow this tiny wildlife path and bring our little rechargeable radio as well. It was one of those that you could plug in or wind up, and it also acted as an emergency lantern if you really needed it to. That kills the batteries very quickly, though. As we walked further, out in the middle of nowhere, there was just this huge coil of wire sticking out of the ground. The wire itself was not weirdly large like some buried transmission wire, but small, like 10 or 12 gauge wiring, the kind you'd see for a house or something. It trailed off into the brush and trees. Naturally, I decided to follow this wire out of curiosity. My cousin trailed behind me as I did. This wire, after seemingly coming straight up from the ground, I could see was strung across the limbs of trees, then back to the ground, snaking around rocks and various things. As we continued to follow it, it finally dead-ended into an outlet, an outlet that was mounted on the side of a desk. It looked like a school teacher's desk, like the kind you would see when I was growing up. It had a metal base and a pseudo-wood plastic top thing, no chair, no building, nothing. Just this weird outlet and this desk in the middle of nowhere. I was staring confused as all hell at this random desk with an outlet in the middle of a forest. That was when my cousin took the radio, pulled out the cord, and then plugged it into the outlet. It lit up and started blaring static. The wire was being fed electricity from somewhere. Now, the place we were at had no road access, no buildings for many miles, and no other people around either. Yet here was this live outlet. It was weird as hell. There was no spooky jump scares or bodies, just one lone powered desk in the middle of the woods. It was quite strange, and a little bit creepy as well. There's this abandoned asylum in Northville, Michigan, that my friends and I explored three times. This is the story of the third time and final time that we ever broke in. I still get chills every time I remember this night. The first two times we went to the asylum were actually more interesting than creepy. We went to explore both times, and we happened to run into some very friendly people there as well. The first time, we ran into another group of high school kids. Really scared the crap out of them at first. The second time, we met a couple of stoner Vietnam vets that gave us a big tour of the place. It was an entire complex, complete with underground tunnels, a morgue, and lots of things from the 50s left over. This time, however, we were completely alone and only had two flashlights between three people. Much like the guy with the story about the World War II base, the echoing footsteps sounded like they were coming from behind you there, and always seemed to take one more step after you stopped. After exploring much of the asylum with this creepy ambiance, and being considerably creeped out now, we already decided to head back to the main building. It was about 18 stories tall, and the view from the top was really good. It was by far the tallest building anywhere remotely close. You could see Detroit from up there practically. As we were nearing the top of the seemingly endless stair corridors, that's when the girl that was with us froze up and whispered for us to stop. I can hear footsteps, she whispered. I tried to tell her it was just our footsteps echoing like before, but when both of them made me shut up and listen, I could hear it clear as day. The unmistakable sound of footsteps coming from the top floor. Now, the building was really tall, but very small area-wise. We were very close to the sounds because of this. Still standing on the stairs, we whispered amongst us about what we were to do about this. My very stupid friend insisted it was probably just another friendly person like the other two times, and we should go up and say hello. I tried to explain to him that you don't want to meet the kind of people pacing on the top floor of an old asylum in the middle of the night. We couldn't convince him, though. He went to head upstairs. I said, screw this, and started running back down, though. 
unfortunately, he followed us, and we got out of there without ever finding who was walking up there that night. To top it all off, a cop passing by on the road spotted us after coming out of the building. We had to run back into the complex to get away. I still think back to that night sometimes and wonder who it was up there. There were definitely no guards, so I think it was either somebody in a gang or the tortured soul of a crazy person. Either way, it was way too close for comfort. My most vivid memory of the late 90s was the Clinton Lewinsky scandal, not because of the scandal itself, but because of the coverage of it. I remember my parents were pissed off at Clinton and kept calling him the deadbeat president. I couldn't watch any TV because they had the news running non-stop. We lived in Maryland and my dad knew somebody who knew President Clinton personally. They were getting the details about what was going on behind the scenes. To clarify, my dad worked for the DOD at the time. Clinton being removed from office would have resulted in some kind of power shift and his direct superior being promoted. What did I care though? I was just a kid and wanted to watch Rocco's Modern Life. I remember my parents inviting over about 10 people and while they had loud conversations downstairs as the TV was playing, I was up in my room being a bitter kid. My parents wouldn't even let me take the smaller black and white TV out of the closet. It's not like I could get it to tune in on the channel I wanted to watch anyway though. I was sitting in my bed listening to one of my cassette tapes, trying to drown out the annoying serious adult conversation taking place downstairs. That was when I happened to glance out the window and down into the backyard. I could see a man I didn't recognize there, moving across the yard quite quickly in the dark. He was avoiding all the patches of light cast by the downstairs windows. I got out of bed and looked out my window a bit closer at him. I remember he was bald and very tall, taller than my dad even. I figured he was just one of the guests that were visiting. Who cares what he was doing in our backyard? I watched him more out of boredom than anything else. A man cautiously came closer to the home, peering into the ground floor windows. I was about to go over to my dresser and flip my cassette tape over, when the man tossed something about the size of a video cassette into our doghouse. Now, our dog Jim had died just a few weeks before. I didn't like this strange man touching the doghouse for any reason, so like the obnoxious kid I was, I walked out into the landing and called out to my parents below. The tone of my voice left no doubt I was unhappy and wanted the situation to be resolved immediately. I remember the silence that followed, lasting way longer than I would have liked it to. What man are you talking about? My mother called back up to me from down below. Everyone became quiet, and all I could hear was the TV. To this day, I've still never seen my dad move quite so fast as he did that night. He shot up the stairs, grabbed me up, and ran back down. My mom and the other house guests followed behind. We all had to wait at the neighbor's house across the street while the police and the bomb squad came. I don't think I realized the severity of this situation until I was much older. At the time, I was more annoyed than afraid. I was asked to share everything I saw. The only way I could describe the man, though, was saying he looked like Captain Picard. I wasn't the best at descriptions. I don't remember most of what happened next. We eventually got back into our house. My dad died of blood poisoning in 2005, and my mom passed away of natural causes soon after. They never told me exactly what that package was, whether it was a bomb or a threat of some kind, but it was definitely something very serious. I remember the police coming back all the time and showing me pictures of possible suspects. I don't remember ever identifying the stranger in our backyard that night. I live in Vermont now, and I really have no ties to the people my parents knew, but at least I have a creepy story for the ages that always entertains people at parties.
This is a story of someone I knew and had to cut ties with because he was a fucking psycho. The first half will be to add context as to why I cut him off, and the second half is what makes it really scary. I don't know if he uses Reddit or any other social media, so I'll omit ages and locations. It started about four years ago when I was living in a friend's house while attending a nearby university. It was myself, my friend, his sister, and their parents. Roughly two weeks into staying there, my friend's sister invited her boyfriend to stay at the house too. By all accounts, he was a pretty cool guy at first, very sociable and full of great stories. We often sat around the table for drinks and talked about life or had a smoke together in the garden. Within the first month though, as he started to get more comfortable, cracks started to appear in this veneer. He would rant about government conspiracies all the time, how he was always a wronged party. He was big into this Sigma male bullshit and martial arts and stuff, and oh boy did he have a temper. He had this big dog he always kept in a cage that was extremely violent whenever he wasn't around. The dog attacked his girlfriend and had to be put down. That's when he started to guilt trip her, and the ranting became incessant. About two months later, he had the bright idea to live in a shipping container, mainly because the parents wanted him to leave by now. He dragged his girlfriend along for the ride. I'm not talking about one of those chic little restoration jobs. This was a rented container in a storage yard on the outskirts of town. That was what they were living in. He would intimidate and threaten the staff there constantly until they called the police on him. This, of course, became another conspiracy to him. He became increasingly abusive to his girlfriend, to the point where the family had to get involved and get her out of there. I remember I had to stick close to him and pretend to be his friend until we could safely get her out. They broke up, which he then blamed me for, claiming I had poisoned her against him to make her mine. Thankfully, she has a new partner now, and they're very happy together. We all blocked that psycho on everything possible, but he continued to harass the family until eventually he disappeared. At least we thought so. Fast forward to last year, and I started to receive messages over social media from several different accounts. I blocked each one immediately when I discovered who it was. Some were friendly, some were hostile. One of the profiles even pretended to be someone I knew from university. That one did trick me. We talked about life and how things were going. Eventually, I was invited to a house party by them, claiming it was a free house and plenty of people were coming. I booked the time off work, made my travel plans, and kept talking to this friend about the coming date of the party. I mentioned it to my friend's sister, who was interested in going herself. That was until I mentioned the address, and she completely panicked. The address in question was a property belonging to the crazy ex's father that was scheduled for sale and therefore would not have many people around. I waited until the day of and called the police to check the property, claiming I suspected a break-in. They found five people there, including the ex. Parked out front was a butcher's van, equipped for food storage, a collection of knives, hammers, and rope as well. I'm glad I didn't go, because I'm pretty sure I know what they wanted to do to me. 